Sometimes it's hard to tell Hitler and Marx apart. Who wrote that Germany's neighbors should accept the physical and intellectual power of the German nation to subdue, absorb, and assimilate its ancient Eastern neighbors? That's Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, authors of the Communist Manifesto, almost a century before the Holocaust. Hitler's underlying admiration for Marxism was obvious. When I made the film, I was expecting, actually, that there will be similarities between the Nazism and, and Soviet communism. But I was actually amazed to discover how similar were those posters. And the posters were so similar that uh, as if uh, one artist had, uh, had drawn them. Of course, I think it is because, uh, it is because they, they were both, their ideologies were very similar. And their expression, therefore, was very similar as, as well. In Mein Kampf, Hitler writes about the Nazi party flag, which is this big red flag with a white disc in the middle and the swastika in the center. Hitler explains it quite clearly in Mein Kampf that the red, the big sea of red that the swastika was in, was intended to attract socialists to his movement. But the red flag was the emblem of the communists. It's the reason why we call them the Reds. But it went deeper than similar ideology and imagery. Until Germany launched a surprise attack on the Soviet Union in 1941, the Nazis and the Soviets worked together. They even put it in writing, signing what was originally sold as a non-aggression pact. But just weeks later, they would invade Poland from opposite sides. It wasn't until much later that we would learn the full scope of the agreement. They uh, signed an agreement in, in 1939 that was called the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, which uh, had secret protocol attached to it. And according to that secret protocol, they agreed on the division of, of the neighboring countries between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. Then there was a secret protocol. which essentially divided Europe into two spheres of influence between Hitler and Stalin. After all, it was not so difficult for them. Both of them were totalitarian regimes. They understood each other. The Soviets were delivering all kinds of uh, raw materials to the Germans. It was not just theoretical friendship. An aspect of their collaboration was the mutual exchange of prisoners. Basically, German communists and Jews, they fled to the Soviet Union in order to be safe. The Soviet Union sent them back uh, to the Gestapo. And many of them, of course, were killed there and perished in the Nazi concentration camps. But is this just a story of brutal, iron-fisted dictators? Or something inherent in the philosophy? The fathers of communism, Marx and Engels, believed that societies would evolve from capitalism to socialism. But they acknowledged that there were still what they called primitive societies that hadn't even evolved into capitalists yet. They called them racial trash. As the revolution happens, the classes and the races too weak to master the new conditions of life must give way. There was only one thing left for those too far behind in the process of societal evolution. The chief mission of all other races and peoples, large and small, is to perish in the revolutionary holocaust. Up until the horrors of Hitler, prominent socialist supporters discussed these ideas out in the open. Nobel Prize winner, Fabian socialist, and prominent Soviet supporter, George Bernard Shaw. I don't want to punish anybody, but there are an extraordinary number of people whom I want to kill. I think it would be a good thing to uh, make everybody come before a properly appointed board, just as he might come before the income tax commissioners, and say every five years or every seven years, just put him there and say, sir or madam, now will you be kind enough to justify your existence? If you're not producing as much as you consume, or perhaps a little more, then uh, clearly uh, we cannot use the big organization of our society uh, for the purpose of keeping you alive, because your life does not benefit us, and it can't be a very much use to yourself. And this was actually somewhat subtle for Shaw. He'd also foreshadow some of the worst atrocities in our planet's history. 
He wrote, I appeal to the chemists to discover a humane gas that will kill instantly and painlessly. In short, a gentlemanly gas, deadly by all means, but humane, not cruel. People like George Bernard Shaw um, were convinced that overpopulation was this terrible, terrible problem, particularly because the unfit, um, the genetically less desirable, were swamping the good genetic types. In the late 19th century, there are I mean, almost the cream of British intelligentsia embracing uh, eugenics well into the early 20th century, saying that thousands, millions, had to be marched off into gas chambers and liquidated. Uh, George Bernard Shaw has this great line where he says, you know, uh, we should do it while playing lovely classical music as we march them into the gas chambers. The idea, a lot of people seem to think that this concept of the gas chamber as a tool of social policy was invented by the Nazis. It wasn't. It was, you know, in a, in a, and I mean this in the most disgusting, evil way, it was perfected by the Nazis. But this idea of using things like gas chambers to kill off millions of people um, so that the rest of the good guys could prosper and move to the sunny uplands of history was immensely popular. All of these systems are based on the idea that we know better. If the little people get in the way of our plan, well, first we'll go around them and then we'll destroy them. This arrogance always ends exactly the same way. One of history's worst examples, the genocide you've never heard of. Next.